Um, welcome everybody to this session. Uh, I'm Victor from the SDK, from the Android SDK team, and my colleagues Luis and Marcos that will present later. So yeah, in this session we are going to talk about the uh, Android SDK. So um, we will start. We will start with an overview about the Android SDK to know uh, what it, the SDK is and what, what it does. Uh, then the presentation will become more technical and we will take a, a look at the code with uh, some code samples and then some demos. And finally, we will see what, what is next, what is going to be next in the SDK. And we would like to have like 10 or 15 minutes at the end just for questions, so if you have any questions during the presentation, just write in the community, uh, the community channel or here. Okay, so let's start why, with what the SDK is. So the SDK is a, it's a common good from the University of Oslo. It's a, a library that facilitates the development of the Android application. And it targets, um, well, all the, the, fun the functionality that is common for the Android applications and mainly uh, the capability to work offline and to communicate with the DSL2 instances, uh, abstracting all that complexity. So if we take a look at the um, at box diagram, um, here we have the DSL2 API, the, the server. The SDK will be here. So the SDK uh, interacts with the web API and with the Android, with the DSL2 server. And the Android application, in this case, the, the official Android application will be on top of the SDK. So the application only interacts with the SDK and it's the SDK who interacts with the API. All these things are a common good from common good from the University of Oslo and is available for you to use it. So you can you can have your own custom applications on top of the SDK at the same level that the official application if you want. So um, let's see the timeline of the Android SDK. Uh, the Android SDK is quite a recent product. Uh, the first release was in December last year, and uh, we have had two more major versions. And in the meanwhile, uh, uh, several bug fixing versions. So the current one is 1.2.1. Um, the next one is planned for early October, aligned with the next version of the Android uh, official application and with the release of the 2.35, because this new SDK will be compatible with that. So let's go to what it does. Um, from, the, from the very beginning, one of the things that the SDK tries to solve was the capability to work offline. So the first thing uh, that it does is the metadata synchronization. So to have the metadata in the device uh, to be fully operational when offline. In the same way, uh, we the SDK does the data synchronization. So the SDK downloads the data to the device to be available to work offline. And when the end users, the data collectors, uh, collect uh, the information, the SDK posts all the data back to the server. Uh, this download uh, the download can be parameterized with different uh, yeah, parameters. And now this is new this year, and we will talk about that later in the presentation. We have a new Android settings web app in the server that is available in the, in the web uh, to define some of these parameters. Uh, so, so we have all the information in the device available for us to work uh, fully offline. Uh, so the next layer that the SDK offers is a data access layer. So it's a, it's a way to present to the developer the information in a very uh, easy and handy way, like this one. Uh, 
uh, more uh, also this again one of the most important things that it does is to support and handle the complexity of dealing with uh, different DSS2 versions. So yeah, the SDK at least uh, guarantees the compatibility with the current version of the two previous ones, but uh, but we will try to do our best and to, and to keep supporting uh, old version if when possible. So here you can see that, for example, the the 1.2 is compatible with the latest six version uh, wide support. What else? Um, because of the nature of working offline and having a device that is not in constant sync with the server, it could happen that there are changes in the server that make that causes some errors in our data when we are downloading or posting. So the SDK also handles the error management to, yeah, to give uh, clues uh, about how to solve the errors that are produced in the, in the synchronization of the data. Uh, integrity check, because we don't download everything. Um, online search, uh, we have said that we mainly work offline, but in some cases, it is interesting to, to have a view of, of, for example, of the TIs in the server, so of, or any other thing. Uh, so it's interesting to to be able to search online. Uh, also, we are working fully offline. And there is this property called unique attributes, and the, the SDK guarantees that these attributes are unique and can be assigned. And also handling with the, in the changes in the model, because the, the model in DHS2 and also in SDK will change with different versions. So the SDK handles uh, the complexity of moving from one model to, to the other. So this is, all this functionality was uh, in, included in the first version of the SDK. Uh, so for you, for those of you who attended the, this same session in Oslo last year, this is familiar. Uh, in, in the last year, we have introduced new features like uh, SMS uh, synchronization, and was also very demanded by the community. Uh, and now the, there is support for synchronizing uh, tracker data, aggregated data. And it is very interesting that uh, it used it uses a compression library that is shared with the backend. So the SMS, the number of SMS required to synchronize the data and the size of the SMS are optimized. Uh, the Android settings app is new this year, and Luis, we will do a demo for this, uh, for this later. Encryption as well, uh, the capability to encrypt the local database in the device. And we will talk about this later as well. Uh, this is very interesting. The, 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 now the SDK uses a shared expression parser uh, and, and is shared with the backend. So now there is a separate uh, product, a separate library that is used by the backend and by the mobile SDK. Uh, to parse the expression of the program indicators, validation rules, and also program rules. So this is really great because now we will expect the same result uh, when executing a program indicator or a validation rule in the backend and in the in, in the mobile because yeah, in, in the past there were some inconsistencies between those two worlds. So now, uh, yeah, this is a really cool thing. And also the validation rules is completely new in this version. And also utility classes. Uh, this is an ongoing thing. And there are operations that are pure DSS2 logic, like for example, decide if a user can add an event in a particular enrollment. So you have to take care of the access uh, permissions and all that. All that kind of classes uh, are in, in are implemented in the SDK as well. This is an ongoing thing. So, uh, as a summary, 
um, yeah, the SDK is is something to facilitate the development of the Android application. It's a product for Android developers. It's not for end users. It's written in Java, uh, although we are moving to Kotlin. Uh, Kotlin, you know, that is the first class language now in Android. Uh, but anyway, it's compatible with Java and Kotlin. The SDK is compatible with, with those. Uh, it, it has it, the SDK has an internal database in SQLite, and the SDK is the result also of a group effort uh, from the SDK team and the backend team. Uh, so together we will try to optimize optimize the calls, uh, so everything is working as efficient as possible. So this is the overview about uh, what the SDK is and what it does. Uh, now we are becoming more technical. And um, Marcos, Marcos, are you there? And uh, here. Hi. Okay. So I will stop presenting. Uh, let's... Okay. Let you go. Mm. Okay, can you see it right? Okay, hello everyone. Uh, this is Marcos Campos uh, from the DHS2 Android SDK team. And now I'm going to introduce you uh, a bit more on the SDK. Let's try to understand what will be a typical workflow using the SDK. Uh, first thing uh, we have to do is instantiate the D2, which is the entry point. Uh, from, D2, from the D2 instance, uh, we will access all the functionality that the SDK offer. So once we have instantiated the D2, we can uh, take all the functionality. We can log in and then we can sync the metadata. We can sync the data and after that we can start working. We can collect all the data that we need, and after that, we can even upload the data. And so the flow could be repeated if you need, again, to sync the metadata, sync the data, and so on. So, okay, then how is the SDK composed? Now, I'm going to present you uh, the SDK data access layer. The SDK uh, provides a bunch of classes that eases the access and operation uh, with the database, but also with the API. So it will hide to the developer all the complexity of accessing and syncing and so and synchronizing with the API. And the developer will only work with the D2 instance, the modules, and the repositories, which is the public part that you can see here. So what's the first thing that a developer will do? Well, he will instantiate D2 because D2 is the entry point uh, to interact with the SDK. And for this instantiation, we only are gonna need the Android context, but we also can uh, add some optional configuration parameters as uh, the app name or the app version. Okay, uh, directly from D2, it's possible to access the modules. And they are used as a wrapper for all the related functionality that we have. And it contains uh, the repositories, and there, there is one repository for each entity type. And they go from the run repository to the track entity instance repository and so on. But we also offer some services and helpers as the period helper, for example. Uh, yeah, here uh, you can find a list of some of the different modules the SDK provides. So you can see here the enrollment module, event, program, relationship, and so many more. And inside these modules, we find the repositories. If you ask yourself, what's a repository? Well, it's 
have a fast shape uh, for the database. So you can use it to read metadata from the database or to read data from the database. But you also can write some data uh, thanks to the repositories. And the repositories offer you a builder composition with compile time validation. What is this builder composition? Well, if you want to access the database and you write an SQL sentence and make a mistake in a fail nine, for example, uh, you probably won't know until runtime. Uh, but with this kind of composition, it is less likely to make a mistake and you can detect it when you're writing the code. And it has also a similar syntax to the Web API, so you can find some filters, nested field, paging, sorting. Um, yeah, if you still prefer to perform an SQL query, uh, the SDK will uh, let you do it. Uh, here you can find an example of the track entity module. Uh, inside the track entity module, you have a lot of repositories uh, like the track entity types, track entity instances, data values, but also some services. Uh, in the end, you can find the reserved value manager. So that's all wrapped in this track entity module. Now, we are going to get into the code uh, with some samples. Uh, here, uh, first of all, we need to configure the SDK. And the only thing we need to do is to pass the Android context. You can also uh, pass some optional params, as I said before. Uh, you can check them in the documentation. But with, but with that, uh, you will create the data configuration. And after that, uh, the only thing you have to, to think to, to do is to call the instantiate method in the D2 manager. So with that, you have the D2 instance and you can start working with the SDK. As you can see here, we have the blocking way. Uh, if you do it like that, you're gonna uh, stop your thread and I will recommend you to use a directive way. The SDK provide both, but we always recommend this second one because you can subscribe to the instantiation of the D2, and once it's finished, you can take the D2 instance and start working with the SDK. After the instantiation, uh, we wanted to follow the typical workflow I, I saw you before. So we could continue by logging in. Uh, if you want to log in, uh, you can go to the user module, and then you can find a method which is logging in and you can pass the username, the password, and the server URL. After logging, uh, you maybe want to download all your metadata. So you can go to the metadata module and just download it with the method blocking the load. And after that, you want to download your data. And for that, we have the repositories. So in this example, we are gonna work with the event module and the event repository. So once you have the instance, you, you call the event module, enter in the event repository. And if you want to fetch all the data that is in the database, you will just call the get method and you will retrieve all the events. But also uh, you can just wanted them a page and you can get uh, called the get page method, and you will retrieve a live data. What is live data? Live data is an Android observable data hodler class that will help you to show the data inside a recycler view. So it will be easier to you to, to show all the data. Also, you can count uh, the events and you can also add some filtering. So in this sample, uh, we are getting the events. So we are getting all the events in your database. But if you wanted to, to filter them, you can use, for example, this filter by organization unit and pass them the organization unit UID. Or even say something like, give me all the events with the event date after this date. Okay. Also, for filtering, we develop uh, different types of operators. 
uh, as you can see here, uh, we have uh, different operators like generic, uh, equal, not equal, in, non in, is null, is not null, booleans, uh, strings, numbers like smaller than or greater than, dates like before, after, in period. In period which is uh, an operator which accepts the period scheme that we provide on the period repository in order to filter dates inside this period. Also we can uh, order, if you want to order for example by event date, you can pass them uh, an enum with the descend or descending or ascending code. You can change the order. Uh, also, only fields stored in the entity table are returned by default. So the events won't have any uh, track entity data value. But if you want the event uh, to have nested some uh, of the track entity data values, you can add it with this method. And also, uh, the repositories offer upload capabilities. So after filtering, you can upload just the data you want to upload. OK, and now uh, data creation. Uh, in this example, uh, we use the event module again. And we add a new uh, event that we just created. And we pass it in this projection, an enrollment, the program, the program states, the org unit, and the attribute combo. UIDs. And with that, we create an event in the database. If we want to make some changes in this event, uh, we can access again in the event repository uh, called the UID method and then set the status, for example, to complete. And what about values? Uh, yeah, it's just something like that. So we can enter the repository of the tag entity data values and go to the value entity UID, a data, data element ID, and you can set the value. Or you can get, uh, you can retrieve it, delete, or as an SDK if it exists. OK. Uh, so that's all from me. Uh, now my colleague Luis is going to carry on with the presentation. Uh, OK. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Luis from the uh, Android SDK team. Um, I will start sharing my uh, screen as well. Can you see it? I guess, yes. Um, yeah, so I'm going to introduce you the Skeleton app. Um, the Skeleton app is an Android app uh, which uses the SDK and has mainly two goals. The first one is to serve as an entry point for developers to develop an Android app from scratch. And the second one, is to show how the SDK is used and all its features. It's available on GitHub uh, and it has two relevant branches. The branch master, which is a basic project showing how to configure and instantiate the SDK. And it only has a login screen and the metadata and the data synchronization buttons. Uh, and also the use cases branch, which is a more advanced project with programs, very simple data entry forms, data sets, and more examples of how the SDK can be used. Uh, if you open it on GitHub, you can see the list of features for each branch. For each branch. Okay, so I'm going to do a short demo. Um, uh, this is how the skeleton app looks like um, once I've already um, logged in and synchronized the metadata and data. Um, so um, as you can see, we have a sync, uh, a sync, sync metadata and sync data buttons on, on the bottom. And at the top, we can see a, a short summary of the metadata and data that we have downloaded. Um, if I click here on the left menu, um, I can see, for example, the list of programs. Uh, you can see them. Um, so I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you how we can make some uh, small changes on the SDK or on the, on the skeleton app using the SDK uh, to change what we can see uh, on the screen. So I'm going to show you, this is uh, the, this is Android Studio. Um, this is the program activity. So the Java class that controls uh, what we see in, in that screen that I just showed you. 
Um, and if I go here to the get programs method, uh, you can see that we're extracting the uh, programs using the SDK, uh, using the data access layer that uh, Marcos just introduced. So you can see here how we get the D2 instance, uh, the program module, uh, using the programs module, you get, we get to the programs repository. And what we're actually using to, to list the programs is uh, getting the programs uh, that uh, belong to a to this given organization units uh, and order them order them by by name uh, in ascendant order uh, we also uh, use pagination so to make sure that we don't uh, overflow the 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 page with too many results uh, and have memory problems um, so what we are going to do now um, is we are going to apply one of those features that uh, Marcus introduced so I'm going to uh, also apply a by name feature uh, with the text T. So if I run the application again, so launch it again, and you can see that it was filtered by name, so I will not see the rest of the programs, only the, the child program. And I can also comment this filter and show you how we can also filter by program type. As you can see, it's really comfortable to do this using the uh, SDK uh, in Android Studio because it will always uh, show me all the possibilities that we have, all the methods and all the uh, possibilities. So for example, uh, here I have the program type, which is an enum. So I will uh, be able to autocomplete, say, okay, give me all the programs without registration. I launch again the application and you will see that only the programs with uh, uh, without registration will be shown. I can also change, for example, the order. So instead of ascendant, I will set the standard. I launch it again. And you see that we were starting with the A. And now then it will be starting with X. So I will also, I also want to show you here on the menu, how we search for tracking the instances. Uh, so we have uh, also a screen where we can uh, search for tracking the instances by attribute, by program, I by entering a, a text. So I will select as an attribute of first name. Program, I will select the child program. And as a text, I will enter frag. So as you can see, it was really fast because uh, it was uh, showing us offline results. Uh, it only showed us a, a targeted instance. Um, and I, what I want to show you is how we get that from the SDK. So if I go to the targeted instance search activity, which is the Java class that controls the screen, um, I can go here to the targeted instances query. Um, and you can see that using the SDK, uh, going through the track entity module, uh, we can access the track entity instance query, which is the object that we use to, to perform this kind of queries. Uh, we can have very different uh, filters. And what we have here is the offline only property. So if I change this by offline first, for example, and I launch the application again, I have to enter the, again, the uh, filters. So first name, child program, fra. You'll see that it took, to, took a while. It was not as fast as the other one, but it also searched for any other uh, track native instances in the server. Um, and it shows us two different results. The first one uh, is synced because it's offline. And the second one, it was uh, downloaded from the, uh, from the API. And to conclude, before I go to the next topic, I want to show you here the, uh, some aggregated data. So I will go to the dataset instances screen. As you can see, we have here all the list of data set instances. Um, I can click on one, see all the data. Okay, um, so I can see again some filters. 
um, in the dataset instance activity, which is again the, the Java class that controls the screen. Um, here is the place where we uh, get to the data. So we access SDK, uh, D2 object, dataset module, dataset instances, and I'm not applying any filters now, but if I change, for example, this and I add um, filter, a filter by dataset UAD, I can start the application again. And you will see that the filter is applied. And I can also uh, apply this to filters combined and say, okay, give me by this dataset UAD and by this period. Launch the application again. And as you can see, there's only one dataset instance uh, with, this, uh, with this configuration. All right, so I'm going to go back to the presentation. And the next topic that I want to talk about is the settings web app that Victor already introduced. Um, so it's not an Android app, but a web app that you can access from the DHIS2 web. And this is how it looks like, how it looks like. And the uh, settings web app defines at the instance level how Android clients should behave. And you can control things like encryption, SMS settings, data syncs, so basically how much data is synchronized and how often. Um, and we also have uh, implemented their uh, sync load simulator, uh, which can tell uh, how much data would be synced for a given user. So it can also help to track problems in the server. Okay, so I'm going to do, uh, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about data bit encryption right now. Um, so as we have told you, the SDK creates a local database in the Android device. Um, and how can users access this database? There are basically two methods. The first one is programmatically. So for that, the SDK manages authentication and authorization. So data can only be accessed in a secure way. Um, but there's another way, which is using the file system. And for that, Android prevents accessing the database, uh, except in root devices. So why do we need encryption? to prevent unauthorized users extract the database and get the sensitive data from root devices. Uh, and this was a, a feature that was really invited by the community. Um, so we have implemented the solution, which was first introduced in the SDK 1.1, uh, which was used in the app version 2.1.0. It's completely transparent from the user and it uses the uh, open source project SQL Cypher. Um, so if it's encrypted or not, uh, can be set uh, at the DHIS instance level uh, by the server, server admin uh, using the Android settings app as we have, uh, as we have introduced. So basically, either all or non devices from a given instance will be encrypted. Um, it's unencrypted by default, so in case nobody had, uh, had, had uh, configured that in the, um, in the settings app, it's uh, unencrypted. And once it's changed in the settings app, it will be changed in the devices in the next login or in the next uh, metadata sync without any data loss. So it doesn't, it will be completely transparent from the user. Um, the database is encrypted with an encryption key, which is securely, securely generated in the SDK and is securely stored in the device as well. And what about performance? Are there any penalties? Uh, so in size, there's a maximum 10% increase uh, that we have uh, observed, which matches the specifications of the SQL Cypher. And in time, there's normally no more than 5 to 10% uh, penalty, so which also matches more or less the specifications from, from, the, from the open source tool. Some queries in the app were a bit slower, uh, but we could, be, we could optimize them. So in the end, there's no penalty observed in a regular use in the app. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the skeleton app and do a demo. Um, if I come here, um, you see I'm in the main screen of the, of the skeleton app. 
I'm going to open the settings app. So I'm just here on a, on a DHIS instance. I go here to the web apps, I click on settings, Android settings. Um, and you can see that the database is not encrypted. Uh, we can also see uh, many other uh, things here on the settings app. So basically you have a general panel and some panels to control program and data syncs and the user sync test that we've already talked about. Uh, I'm not going to go through too much into detail, but you can see here how you can configure uh, how much data, how often the data is synchronized, SMS um, configuration, how many reserve values are downloaded, and finally the encryption, which is what I'm going to, to present now. So um, if I go here um, to the Android file system, so basically I'm right now in the file system of the emulator or the Android device, uh, you can see here that I'm inside the package of the skeleton app in the directory databases. So if I show here what I have, uh, you will see that I will only have here one database. These are uh, temporary files. So actually there's only um, one database, which is unencrypted. So I can go here and say, okay, escalate, uh, type the name of the, of the database and say, for example, and enter an S SQL query like select everything from the table user and you see that i can see the data from the from the user uh, just reading the the database so i come back here to the to the setting uh, setting up i say that i want to encrypt the database save it uh, go back to the um to the skeleton app and perform a metadata sync. So you will see that it takes a while, but it's not because it's migrating the, the database, but also it's also downloading all the all the metadata. So it takes around a half minute. Um, so basically every time that we once we change this parameter in the in the settings app, in the next synchronization or in the next login, the uh, database will be encrypted or unencrypted uh, and it will be completely transparent for the user. So the synchronization is done. Uh, you can see that we have exactly the same number of, of uh, metadata and data values here. Um, and if I come back here to the, to the file system, I can show uh, the list of databases. You see that instead of having an unencrypted database, I have an encrypted database. So if I try to do the same thing that I did before, SQLite 3, enter the name of the database and I say select everything everything from user uh, the tool will tell me okay this is not a database because it's encrypted so I'm not able to extract all the data using the file system okay so I think this was everything from my side uh, and Victor will continue with the presentation right now yeah, thank you. So, so hi. Um, so we are going to see now the two more topics about the Android SDK. Uh, the first one is the compatibility, uh, because we have talked about compatibility, that the SDK is compatible with the latest three versions. But now uh, we are going to see what it means for an application and for a developer. So. The SDK is compatible uh, with the latest three version, at least. I mean, uh, we will give full support for the latest three, but we have basic compatibility as long as possible. For example, we the SDK is now still compatible with 2.29 because there is no uh, major breaking change. So, but if a new feature is coming in the SDK and it's not compatible with those versions, we will probably not introduce them. Um, so the SDK also blocks the connection to non-supported versions to prevent errors. Are the good thing about uh, yeah, using the SDK and the changes in the web API is that the changes in the SDK are can be detected at compile time instead of at runtime. 
so it can be really fixed and following the upgrade nodes, they can be uh, updated. So just now a few examples about what it means for, for the code, for the developer. So uh, this is an example of a minor change. Uh, in 229, for example, we have the capture coordinates property in the program. The class uh, in 230, we have feature type, that is an extension of cap capture coordinates. Uh, in capture coordinates, we have true false. Now we have a bunch of polygons, of, of type of polygons. So here between, between them, we can do this kind of mapping. So the result of all this is that in the SDK, we keep both properties, capture coordinates and feature type. Uh, so the developer can decide which one to use. Uh, we mark the capture coordinates has duplicated and it will be removed in the next or uh, next version of the, of the next one. And we recommend to use feature type, but it's not a breaking change. So we try to not break the code of the application by using SDK when possible. Uh, this other example is an example of a breaking change. Uh, if you know, in the 230 version of CSS2, the model of the relationship type and relationship change completely, completely. Um, so the approach in this case was to force the application to use the new model and the SDK handles the compatibility under the hood. So let's suppose we have an application and an SDK 1.0 compatible with 229 and 228, 230 appears, and the SDK 1.1 that is compatible with 230. So in this case, uh, we force the application yeah, to do some changes in their code to adapt to this new model, and they will still be compatible with 229, 228. So using the new model, the SDK guarantees the compatibility with the three latest version. And this links uh, with, this, with this slide about the how to upgrade the applications in the field. So let's suppose we have um, an application, um, 1.0 application in the field with thousands of users uh, and we want to update the server, that is 229, we want to update it to 230. So in this case, uh, the first step is to, to have an application, that a new version of the application that is compatible with 230, and we need the users to upgrade in first place. It doesn't matter if this process takes uh, a few weeks or a few months, because application is still compatible with the previous version of DTS2, so they can still use the application. And once all the users in the field uh, have upgraded the version of the app, we can move the server to 230 and continue working without interruption. And the last topic is about uh, error management. Um, because we are working in a fully offline environment, uh, we need some extra checks about the data. So uh, in the regarding metadata, we check that all the metadata that, that we don't load makes sense, that there, is, there are no inconsistent, inconsistencies in the metadata. And what the SDK does is uh, try to continue and store the error for feature inspection by administrator. And yeah, I mean, try to continue but keeping metadata integrity, always. This is regarding metadata, about data, because we are also in an offline environment. Uh, the metadata in the server can change and can cause errors in the data. What the SDK does is it tries to identify as many details as possible about the conflicts, so the application can give some feedback to the user to solve the errors. So in aggregated, we try to identify the conflicting data values. In tracker, uh, basically tries, tries to identify, if possible, 
down to the track identity attribute or data element level. So in some cases, this is a, a screenshot from the official capture app. Uh, if we have all that information, we can give the user some feedback about this is the failing, this is the failing data element and this is the, the cause of the conflict. Okay, so this is all about functionalities. Uh, what we have in the CK right now, we are talking about the feature for its coming. Uh, what we talk about utility classes, uh, pure discharge to logic about uh, inspiration, validation, and all that stuff that is common to, to all the DHS2 applications. We want to increase uh, yeah, that capability of this to, to do those evaluations. Deck the glass support. If uh, you are working with protected or closed programs and you are in the physical application, if you uh, have tried to access data in the search scope, maybe you have noticed that there is no support for that. It's something that we should add. Um, more features about, about analysis. Um, for, to have a simple local analytics module to do some calculation about number of TIs, uh, average of uh, specific data element, things like that, that are very helpful for the users. Uh, and also the evaluation of the indicators that are embed in the data entry screen. Working list. Uh, from an end user, um, from a community worker perspective, is very useful to filter the, the event or track entity instances that are assigned to that user or scheduled for today. The support for multi-user, multi-server, uh, I think I've not, I've, not, I've not mentioned that, but the SDK only supports one user and one server at a time. Uh, but in some cases, um, the same device is used by several users, or maybe the same user need, needs to use several instances, like for example, one instance for tracker data, another one for aggregated data. So we want to give support for that. Uh, more granularity in the metadata synchronization. Now is everything that is uh, that is uh, relative to the user. And offline and offline support. Um, but, uh, because we know that in some cases, uh, in environments where the devices are used indoors, and you know that there is a good connectivity, maybe it makes sense to work online and to save and access the data uh, from the server directly. And finally, widgets and UI components, right? uh, for example, this organization unit tree that is always a nightmare to build this, yeah, this tree in the application or value type uh, forms. So all that things could be extracted in a new model that is common for the, all the application. Um, about learning resources, uh, this year, yeah, the academies uh, are going to be online, of course. And we plan to have an Android developer academy uh, in the first quarter of 2021 will be online. Uh, we have not uh, dates yet, but the plan is to have it in the first quarter. And this is the list of yeah, resources that, uh, that is available for you if you want to take a look, the source, the source code of the SDK, documentation about how to use it from the developer perspective is more or less what we have seen here, but more, much more extended. The skeleton app, if you want to use it, has a starting point for your application. Uh, Jira, to, keep it, to, give, to report a bug or a new feature, and the community. So just to sum up the, the session, um, so if you need, if you need uh, to build a new application because the official application 
does not fit your needs. Uh, and you need the application to, yeah, to work offline, to be compatible with different data versions and to manage all those all that complexity of dealing with errors, having good performance, and upgrading new, new versions, and ma much more things that will come in the SDK. So yeah, I think it's interesting to try uh, the SDK uh, for that kind of application. So yeah, the recommendation is to, if you are in that position, just give it a try. Uh, yeah. So I think that's all. That's all on my side. We have uh, five minutes for questions. Um, okay, it seems that we, ha we have two questions. Um, okay, uh, I see one question in the panel and I don't know if there is any question in the community. Yeah, so Okay, the, the question in the panel is, uh, is from Monjur. Hi, Monjur. Uh, which chart library was used in Android Capture App or DSHS2 related Android app? Uh, which chart library? I, do, I don't know if we have any chart uh, library in the Android Capture App. Uh, I don't know if. Pablo is there or Jose that could help on this. Uh, but it is that that's something that is coming, but it's not there yet. No uh, one is about to speak. No. We just added okay. Pablo and Jose as panelists so they can respond. Okay. Hi. Okay. So, um, hi, Manjur. Uh, I think we don't have any chat in the Android app right now. Um, so I don't. I don't know what you're referring to. I, I, if you if you're there, maybe, maybe you can add some clarification in your question. While you're waiting for that, there is another question in the community of practice. Um, that asks, is it possible to use the Android SDK within footler slash Dart? Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, uh, Pablo, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that this currently is not possible to use it in Flutter Dart. Uh, actually, you can use it in Flutter. You can use it in Flutter and in Kotlin multi-platform, but it will only be compatible compatible with the Android part of the multi-platform project. So you can you can have a Flutter uh, project with iOS and um, use using the, uh, the SDK for the iOS part of the project. You can use it for the Android. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, the SDK is moving also uh, to calling the the code. So. Yeah, eventually, if the Kotlin multi-platform evolves and the SDK is written in native Kotlin, so eventually, at some point, it could be used. But right now, only for the Android part of the yeah. okay. And there's one last question that was just added to the community of practice, which is, how much is the database access speed affected with encryption? OK. Uh, Luis, do you want to? That, uh, Victor? Um, yeah, so uh, the specifications of the, of the open source uh, tool that we're using is that it should be, or it could be around 10% slower. And this was mainly what we saw in our experiments. Uh, we saw that there were some queries that were a bit slower, but we could optimize them. So mainly, so basically I could say, uh, 10% slower and it doesn't, you don't really notice it when you're using an encrypted database. Okay. Um, so I think we don't have more questions, right? Yep, that's it. Okay. So yeah, it's time. So thank you all for attending this 
session and just don't hesitate to tweet to us if you have any doubt or do you want to try the SDK. So thanks. <laughs>